Is there a law of first mention in Bible interpretation? That is, is it true that the very first mention of some or other concept in the Bible contains all the truth of that concept in seed form? The internet says that there is. So you call this the law of the first mention. The law of first mention may be said to be the principle that requires one to go to that portion of the scriptures where doctrine is mentioned for the first time and to study the very first occurrence of the same in order to get the fundamental inherent meaning of that doctrine. The law of first mention. Wherever God mentions it first in his word, that's his intended will and his intended desire. Dr. E. W. Bullinger. Bullinger said a century ago or so in his book, How to Enjoy the Bible, the first occurrence of a word or an expression or an utterance is the key to its subsequent usage and meaning, or at least a guide as to the essential point connected with it. Examples the internet gave of this principle, the law of first mention put to work include these. For example, the word love is not used in its first mention to describe the relationship of a husband and wife, but a father-son relationship. This may be counterintuitive and only in the New Testament it will be dismantled why this is of utmost importance for the human race and the entire universe. Secondly, we can analyze the word blood and discover that it is not just a red life-sustaining liquid for God. It's mentioned in Genesis 4.10 and we learn that it cries to God. So we see that blood speaks. All the innocent blood of murdered people is not forgotten. It still speaks to God today. So is there a law of first mention? No. Okay, okay, I'll say more. I'm embarrassed to say that when I first heard of this so-called law of first mention, no objections occurred to me. I just figured that the person so confidently affirming this principle, calling it indeed a law, knew what he was talking about. Plus, it sounded nifty. You know, the law of first mention, ooh, like a secret key to understanding the Bible. And at this stage in my life, you know, anything that might impress Christian girls was worth hearing. I was the first person to ask you to the play, so by the biblical law of first mention, which did I mention is biblical, you should go with me instead of him. I don't remember who first informed me of the law of first mention. I assume it was a preacher. And I'll bet that what he ended up saying, the doctrine he derived from this principle was probably true, or at least nifty. He was trying, I assume, to stimulate and guide people's Bible study. These are worthy goals. But he ended up confusing and misleading anyone who actually tried to use this law in their personal Bible reading. He got somewhere good, I assume, but he got there by taking a shortcut that he shouldn't have taken. People who love the Bible sometimes expect that it give them more truth than God put in it. And though I'm about to have some fun with the law of first mention, I want to say that in all my experience, the people who tried to make up for God's failure to promulgate this law by proclaiming it themselves, these people appear to me to be sincere. I am not here to mock sincere brothers and sisters in Christ who are just trying to accord honor to the Bible. I will aim my fun at ideas, not people. And I don't actually like having to be Mr. Killjoy going around shooting down people's hermeneutical principles. To be honest, I've never heard anyone use the law of first mention to prove anything untrue, though I feel rather confident that this has occurred outside of my experience. If I shoot down sacred cows, I feel none of the thrill of the hunt. Cows aren't hard to get. I'm only putting this poor cow out of its misery in order to teach us the true law of discovering the meaning of Bible words. I'll get there at the end. So, the first reason there is no law of first mention. We don't know the original order of the Bible books, and there is no official order given to us by God. When I first heard of this law of first mention, I don't think I knew at this stage in my life that the order of the Bible books is not given to us officially by God. The traditional Protestant order goes back only to the advent of printing. And there are competing traditions with competing orders. Logos Bible Software has a helpful interactive tool comparing them all. 
And for about the first half of the history of the Old Testament, there was no order of Bible books at all. I mean, the, the Torah books were in a narrative order, but the books were all in scrolls. Some of the books were collected into groups, namely the Torah, like I said, the prophets and the writings, and some were obviously telling a story and belong in the order of that story, like Genesis and then Exodus. But what if the only mentions of a given word were in two minor prophets written around the same time? Which would count as the first mention? And now look how fast we're going. Isn't this exciting? Here's reason number two why I don't think there is a law of first mention. I kind of cheated and put two reasons in one just so I could have three in the end, but pay no attention to the reason behind the curtain. Number two, often the law of first mention yields something inane not worth knowing, and it potentially could be used to state untruths. I suggest that any time you hear an interpretive principle suggested to you, try it somewhere unexpected, and try it repeatedly. See if it works. It may work, but if it doesn't, you will know it by its fruits. The, the fruits it produces will be worthless or maybe even ridiculous or just wrong, and I think that's exactly what happens with the law of first mention. So. In the beginning, God created. This is the first use of beginning. So, so what exactly? I guess we could say that beginnings happen at the start of things, and we could turn the Maria von Trapp song into a hymn. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. If it wasn't inane for her to say that beginnings are a very good place to start, maybe it won't be for us. Okay, so is this what's being taught here? My creativity is already running out. I've trained myself, with the help of a lot of others, to read Bible sentences and Bible paragraphs. I don't like piling so much meaning on one word. But let me dutifully try the law of first mention on another word. In the beginning, God created. Genesis 1.1 says that God created. This should be good because the creation evolution debate is a hot topic. And if you want to know my views on it, you can read Biblical Worldview, Creation, Fall, Redemption. It's available in Logos Bible Software and from BJU Press. Okay, so... I guess the law of first mention tells us that God is the only creator, or that God is creative, or that creation is a divine attribute, or that creation happens at the beginnings of things, or that all created things have beginnings, or that creations happen inside beginnings. And please don't make me pull out that poor aisle baseball joke about the big inning, har, har, har. Speaking of inning, what about the very first word of the Bible, in? That word becomes very important in the New Testament, right? That's where we find that all the spiritual blessings we get, we get in Christ. Surely, according to the law of first mention, there would be some connection between the very first word of the Bible and this key doctrine of being in Christ. This must tell us something essential about inness. Well, if it does, I'm not smart or creative enough to discern it. I had to work hard to think of anything else to draw from the law of first mention when applied to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But I finally came up with something, something uh, suitably creative. Let's see what you think. Maybe the law of first mention would teach that it's God who begins all beginnings since he began this one. That'll preach. God begins all beginnings. Okay, so let's roll with this. Think, 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 think. All of the advocates for the law of first mention that I have ever heard were strongly anti-Calvinist. This is not the place to enter into a discussion of that debate, as I've said on this channel before, maybe someday. And again, this is only my experience. It may not be yours. Indeed, I'd love to hear in the comments where and when you first heard or have heard the law of first mention. But I must observe that the next mention of the word begin comes in Genesis 4. To Seth was born a son, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. If God begins all beginnings, then God is the one who induced men to call on the name of the Lord. Kind of like irresistible grace. 
Sounds kind of Calvinist to me. But then again, the first mention of the word name, in fact, the first three mentions are all names of rivers in Genesis 2. That has to be saying something given the law of first three mentions. So the name of the Lord in Genesis 4 must really mean the river of the Lord. And the first mention of of is in Genesis 1, 2. So therefore, somebody please stop me before the Bible I'm holding bursts into flames. We're in Bible numerics territory here, folks. This is just totally ridiculous. I am through this law of first mention, clearly making the Bible say something it isn't saying. Obviously, Genesis says many foundational things about humanity, where we came from, why we're here, what went wrong, who's going to fix it. But I don't need the law of first mention to know any of this. And surely, if the law of first mention should work anywhere, it would be in Genesis. I mean, in Genesis 1, right? But I dare say it just doesn't work. This law doesn't seem to tell me anything certain or anything useful. And if it does, it's only useful in hands that are a little too creative. This law just distracts the reader from the plain statement of the text, which is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bible teachers and students would do better to just read the text than try to apply to it a law that doesn't exist. A third reason there is no such law as the law of first mention. Here's number three. The law of first mention assumes we're all using the same Bible translation, but we're not. Proponents of the law of first mention never, in my experience, dig into the details of this alleged law. They dust it off and pull it down from the shelf when it's needed to buffer a weak point they care to make. Then it goes back up there next to the even more common law of preach louder until another weak point needs more support. But I have some more questions. Does this law apply to Hebrew and Greek or just to English? The King James Version translators, for example, did what all other translators and uh, in all other languages do, they varied the English words that matched up with Hebrew and Greek ones. They explain this in some detail in their preface. They specifically say that they use travels in some places and journeys in other to translate the same Hebrew or Greek word. Again, all translations do this. So, is the doctrine of traveling contained in the first mention of the English word or the first mention of the Hebrew one? Or does it work in all English translations? How could it when they all do the same thing the King James translators did? They vary their word choice for stylistic and other reasons that are just too numerous to mention at this point in this video. And does this law apply to French or Russian or Urdu Bibles or whatever it is they speak in Djibouti? No, it's just not possible given the complexities of language that this law could work in Bibles in all languages. In Logos Bible software, I work for the company that makes it. We have tons of tags on Bible words. We tag grammatical information. We actually tag figures of speech. We tag speakers and addressees. We tag places. We tag preaching themes. There's actually more and more of this. That's why it costs money. Humans have to do this. But we do all the tagging in Hebrew and Greek, not in English or French or Urdu, because translations are translations and originals are originals. What is a figure of speech in Hebrew may get rendered very prosaically in English, like I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities being translated as I gave you hunger in all your cities. But the fact that some translators choose to translate a figure of speech as something else, which I think is absolutely okay in principle, by the way, depending on your audience and other factors, and I, I think is frequently necessary, doesn't erase the fact that it's still a figure of speech in the Hebrew or Greek. So we mark the original at Logos, where I work, not the translations. You can see the tags in the translations only because the translations are tied back word by word to the originals. Again, actually by humans, not computers. I get completely why people expect words in the Bible to be magic words. They're divine. Shouldn't they be extra powerful? Even alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword? Yes, I absolutely believe in the truth of Hebrews 4.12 that I just quoted with all my heart. 
But the words of the Bible are also human words. Hearing them is not like touching the hem of Jesus' garment and getting healed. You have to understand them first. And the Spirit has to open your eyes to their significance for you. Expecting them to have magical powers is like expecting the Jesus of the Incarnation to be able to run faster than a speeding bullet, to leap tall buildings in a single bound, and to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. No, Jesus walked from place to place. He got tired, and he wasn't a superhero, or I'm pretty sure an American. He was something far better than all of those things. The law of first mention doesn't work. There is no such law. The Bible never reveals such a law. The three words that best describe this law are as follows, and I quote, bunk, bunk, bunk. So how do we know what Bible words mean? If the sacred cow of the law of first mention lies dead at my feet and I am holding a smoking shotgun, I had better have a sacred horse or pig or camel at the ready to replace it. And I do. It's this. Usage determines meaning. We know what words mean by listening to how they are used. This is true in English, true in French, and true in the biblical languages, Hebrew and Greek. It's also both super simple, something every baby, literally every baby in the world does without even trying, and complicated enough to fill tons of bookshelves carried around the world by sacred camels. And this video is long enough, so I want to recommend some follow-up study resources instead of explaining all this right now. I promise these resources are fun. You can watch or read or listen to them while riding the sacred camel of linguistics books to the sacred oasis of lexicographical understanding. You'll love it. My first recommendation, link in the show notes, is a chapter in a free book written by my godly elder friend, Vern Poitras. I run his website. I assign this chapter of his book to students of mine in a seminary in a class I teach every year. It's called Words and Precision. It's part of a free book on Poitras's website called Symphonic Theology. Take up and read. The second is a general recommendation that you listen to Lexicon Valley, a podcast by atheist linguist John McWhorter. I just don't know a better person, minus the occasional discussion of cuss words, he doesn't tend to use them, just talk about them, than John McWhorter to teach the field of linguistics in an engaging way. He is the best popularizer there is in any field that I'm aware of, and he's a kind of tireless like me. His great courses on language are also excellent, minus the stuff on the evolutionary origin of language. You might be able to get those courses at your local library. I am able to do so in my area. And plus, I went on his podcast, Lexicon Valley, back in 2017. It was seriously one of the highlights of my entire life, one of the greatest honors I've ever experienced because I admire him so greatly. I often have occasion to tell people that a little study of linguistics might actually be better than a little study of Greek, or even sometimes a lot of study of Greek. I value highly the study of the original languages of scripture, but my personal gut feeling is that knowing how words work will save you from more interpretive gaffes than knowing Greek will. Ideally, learn both, sure, but if you can only do one, and you can do this one, learning language, because it's as easy as signing up for a fun and nerdy podcast and listening to it for a few years, then do it. Learn how language works. There's this kind of cheesy illustration you've probably heard a million times, an old chestnut from sermons. There's this ancient boy somewhere in Asia who wants to learn about jade from an old master. Why he wants to learn, we are never told. I suspect it has something to do with getting to the next level in an ancient video game. Anyway, the master puts jade in his hand and tells him to hold on to it. Then the master goes on to talk about all kinds of other stuff for hours while the boy holds the rock. Same thing the next day. Same thing the next. The boy finally grows exasperated. But I wanted to learn about jade and you're talking about all this other stuff, he says. The master says, be patient, my son. Because that's what masters say in Chinese parables and stuff. In any case, the process goes on for a time until, one day, the master places the rock in the boy's hand as usual, but the boy suddenly bursts out, that's not jade. I'm sorry to be so vague. I'm plenty specific about this stuff in other places, linguistic stuff. 
but I really do think that gaining a feel for language is like this, cheesy as it may seem, jaded as you may be. It just takes time and experience working through the ideas in your mind. But someday, after you've read through some great books like D.A. Carson's Exegetical Fallacies, there's another recommendation, and you've gone through my 50 False Friends in the KJV series here on YouTube, which uses principles of linguistics and lexicography nonstop, and you've listened to John McWhorter, after all that, you'll be listening to a sermon, and the preacher will say, now, according to the law of first mention, and you'll suddenly leap up and shout, that's not Jade. That's an illegitimate appeal to a non-existent hermeneutical principle that just cannot possibly account for the lexicographical data and is probably being employed for merely rhetorical purposes in order to obfuscate the matter and silence the internal counter-arguments of any would-be objectors. And I, the old master, will nod sagely with a hint of a smile at one corner of my mouth.